revolution of one the revolution will be live streamed what's up everybody this is tk coleman i've said it before i'll say it again i am not here to settle for trying to create a society in which everyone feels free i'm trying to inspire individuals who will fight for and figure out how to live freely in any kind of society because no matter how you set up the world there will always be forces and factors that work against us and in order to be free, you got to see freedom as the type of thing that you, that you always got to be willing to fight for and uh, that you always got to be willing to show up for and take responsibility for creating in the world around you. So uh, if you want a little bit more of that flavor, stay tuned. If you don't like that flavor, stay tuned because you really need to hear it. You really need to hear this kind of talk. Well, today is going to be a year end review and this is going to be the first part. Uh, Kamau and I have done many interviews over the course of the year. And we've talked to a lot of interesting guests who said a lot of interesting things. And as we're getting now uh, pretty close to, to the end of 2020, the end of 2020, praise God, this year has been something else. But there has been a lot of a lot of good in this year. But as we get close to the end of the year, what we want to do is do some episodes where we play some of our favorite clips from our past guests. And then we'll just riff on them together about our thoughts and reactions. So it's time to get started. Brother Kamal, how you doing, man? Hey, what's up? What's up? Yeah, it was crazy to think about that 2020 is coming to an end. I mean, it it's it just seems like it's been an infinite year that it's kept going and more things have happened. Um, yeah, it, it's I, I mean, even in my own life, I've had something happen two days ago that was very hard for my family, um, a family mm -hmm. friend. Um, something like imploded in their family and it caused a big rift. Uh, so it's mm. it, 2020 has just set on all kind of fires um, and just really shook shook up the world in so many different ways. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people uh, resonate very strongly with that. And, and we've had some offline conversations, a lot of challenges, a lot of losses. Um, definitely a, a season for reflection. I'm, I'm hoping everybody has good holidays, though, and, and hopefully we can feed into that by giving you all some uh some inspiring and insightful uh, lessons from the year. So we're just gonna dive right in. We're gonna start off with the first clip. Our first guest was uh, Urban Monk. And he, you know, we had this conversation with Urban Monk right when we were in the height of the uh, the George Floyd aftermath and, 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 and the Black Lives Matter uh, debate. And we talked with him about what it's like being the father of interracial children who are dealing with race, uh, part black, part Puerto Rican, what it's like for him to be a youth pastor and dealing with congregations that uh, represent many different sides of the political spectrum and so forth. And I recommend everybody check out that full episode with the Urban Monk. We actually had him join us to do two episodes. This was one of my favorite moments from him where he's talking about race and he tells the story of something that his uh, oldest daughter uh, came home and said to him one day in, in a fit of anger and what he learned from it. So this is the Urban Monk, the Urban Monk episode. I came downstairs and my oldest, she was sitting on the couch and she doesn't mind me sharing this. And she said, dad, I'm really struggling today. And I said, wow, what's up, what's going on? And she says, I am trying so hard not to hate white people. I'm trying so hard. Hmm. And so a part of me, you know, I my my knee jerk reaction was to say, well, you know, you know, there's a lot of good white people out there. You know, I wanted to come in <laughs> and, and, and give a, a knee jerk reaction. Uh, but something just said, just wait, you know, just just let her talk about her frustration and where she is. And so I said, OK. Tell me more about that. <laughs> and I just let her talk. And then she began to say, and I know that that's not right because of uncle so-and-so and these people and the people in her life. And she began to come through it as I made space for her to just get the frustration out and to share the emotion. But mm. I think like that she was at her limits. <laughs> And I couldn't allow her to be back in that situation. I had let them uh, suffer enough, you know? And I don't think that we should, 
try to keep them from everything bad in the world because our kids, it's like what they talk about with this whole COVID thing. Like your immune system needs to take in some germs yeah. to be able to fight off other germs. And so I think healthy dosages of these negative experiences where mm-hmm. they're able to process it and think through it, you're able to help them navigate it. I think they can get better at that as life goes on and they'll be better human beings for it is our hope, you know? I hope that gets at your question a little bit, but that would be my take. That was a powerful moment. I mean, because that's my family too. I I know the daughter who said that, so that made it extra funny and extra meaningful for me. But man, I, I think that really hit on one of the most important insights that came out of this period of having difficult and contentious discussions. And that was, you don't know how to properly react and respond to someone until you take the time to listen. And the first few words or sentences that comes out of a person's mouth, it's so tempting to just be like, I disagree. Well, you're wrong or you're this and you're that. And then to just go into those pre-prepared, pre-released talking points. And there's just nothing like the power of listening because what people are feeling on the inside and what what they know to be true at a level that's deep down can be so different from the things they say um, when they're in a state of, of heightened emotion. So I thought that was just a powerful lesson to take into any discussion about race, about politics, but even dealing with family conflicts or relationship challenges like Listening is a very self-interested act because you get the information that you need to create the results that you want to create. Yeah, you know, I just add in a little bit more context to the situation. Uh, the urban monk is your older brother. And even yeah. though you, you just mentioned that that was family, like that that's really close family. That's immediate family. And, and your niece is somebody who uh, you're very invested in. You know, you, you believe... Um, wholeheartedly and you're a present uncle and you know this this hit really close to home with you so um, I I think that's just such an interesting dynamic right because you knew the little girl uh, you 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 know you know her personality you know her character and so it was just a a really special interview for one um, but you know to be talking about such a heavy topic um, of like racism and kids experiencing racism uh, I think it was just uh, just, just, just a really interesting culmination of all these different, uh, you know, factors that that were really close to home, and and what I also think about that specific clip, and I think the reason that it was so funny is because, you know, sometimes you'll hear adults or just people um, out of anger kind of talk like that, like, oh, I hate, I hate these people, or I hate that people, um, and you know, in in some regards, like they. They're just frustrated, but in some regards, like they're speaking truth. But to hear that come from a kid, like it, it's a surreal moment. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, that just came out of your mouth. Um, but you know, kudos to to the urban monk for being able to uh, receive that kind of anger and uh, hatred and lash, like lashing out from from a child, um, and know how to kind of you know just stay present and hold space in that moment and you know help her work through that and i think that's just such an important thing because i think it's emotional immaturity when you take something that's happened to you and you you know you're 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 so angry and you just lash out um but you aren't able to really process those feelings and and allow them to help you make constructive decisions going forward and i and i think you know it's it's really easy to say um i hate white people because X, Y, Z. Um, I think the harder thing, the thing that takes, uh, you know, more, more of an, more of a developed emotional IQ and, and just more thought is, is really understanding, um, what's been done, but also, you know, how can you be a better, uh, how can you be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem? And I think it, it was, that was just a really beautiful illustration. And, uh, you know, it was funny because like, again, like we, we understand like what's been done and, and what continues to be done and what it feels like to be on the other side of racism. But all of us know, you know, good people from every race, whether they're white, whether they're Spanish, whether they're 
you know, Armenian or, or whatever. Um, and so I, I, I think it was, it was really cool because we acknowledge these feelings of hatred, but at the same time, like, you know, we, we know good people and hearing urban monk talk about like, um, those good people and, and hearing his daughter, uh, say, well, you know, I know this isn't right because X, Y, Z, like it, it was just a really cool, cool experience here in that story. Yeah. You know, I, I often encourage people. I think this sounds very contentious at first, but I often encourage people just be more selfish, be more selfish. So when, when, when I talk about, um, Hey, you know, every demographic has people that you can learn from. That's a very selfish way to see reality. You have a lot to gain from that view of reality, right? Like it's not about, hey, I don't want to fit anybody or hey, I want you to like everybody and I want everybody to know that I stand for you liking everybody. It's like, no, like if you're interested in your own well-being and your own success, then you will try to extract something meaningful and useful from every person that you encounter. You will try to learn something from everyone that you encounter and you never want to get caught up, so caught up and your own hatred or disgust for people or for demographics that you miss out on the wins for you that are located in all these awesome opportunities to learn. One other thing, man, too, that jumped out at me just as a broader application. I heard somebody say one time that it's not about teaching people what to think. That's not the problem. The problem is people don't know how to think. And the reason they don't know how to think is because we're so uncomfortable with the uncertainties and the risk involved in the thinking process. Because when people start to think, oh my gosh, they might come up with the wrong belief, you know, mm. or oh my gosh, they might end up in the wrong place. And so we interrupt people so early on in the thought process to tell them what they ought to think. And mm. when she said that initial statement, yep. his inclination was to be like, no, let me tell you the right way to think. And he was like, tell me more. And that applies to a lot of things. I mean, how many people come home and be like, I hate my job after the first day of work. I hate my job. And, and, and what do we do? We, we instinctively say, hey, man, you can't be like that. This was just your first day of work. No, mm -hmm. let the person mm -hmm. think, why do you hate your job? And chances are they will talk themselves into a space of being like, well, I don't really hate my job. But man, today was just a real hard day. I had this crazy customer, whatever. I know it's going to get better. And it's like, there you go. Just helping people process and not just jumping on top of the first thing that people say. I'm gonna go to this next one. This was from Richard Taylor. And, and, and Richard Taylor, you know, does a lot of uh, talking and writing about mental health. Just a real good brother, a brother that I know from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Uh, thanks to uh, my brother, Sean Dove, for connecting, connecting us with Richard Taylor. And, and this was one of my favorite moments from him where he talks about mental health stereotypes, particularly in Black communities several things taking place during that time. The first was that I was not privy to the fact that I was dealing with what we would now identify as, you know, being suicidal, dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety. And that comes from the stigmas that we have a lot of times in the black community when we talk about mental health, right? Black people don't deal with this. Your ancestors dealt with worse. I grew up in the church. So for me, it was a, a huge part of the conversation was around, um, you know, it's, it's a demon, just pray about it, right? Or I'm not praying hard enough. All of these different things and none of it, even though it was, and I, I say this a, a lot of times to audiences now, when it comes to parents, guardians, definitely from different communities of color, man, one of the things that I'm noticing more and more is that, they literally tried to give encouragement with good intention off of what they knew, which wasn't much, specifically <clears throat> around the conversation of mental health, because it wasn't mm. discussed. We learned to suppress. We learned to push yeah. it all down, and that was it. We weren't privy to how this thing worked, triggers, all of these other things. It was simply, hey, you better go depress them dishes or I give you everything that you need. You, you, you have no reason to be sad. This idea that the happiness comes through material and provision um, in that kind of way a lot of times, right? And so I don't, I don't hold anger or frustration with my parents. I understand that they just really didn't, they didn't get it at the time, right? And it's not just me and my situation. That's with many of us. And in and, and the time that our folks grew up in, and then of course our grandparents, right? 
We weren't taught emotional intelligence, emotional stability, how to acknowledge, you know, and then of course, what happens in this house stays in this house. So the idea of going to therapy was not even a thing that we were going to address. Yeah, that's uh, a... <laughs> This is a, a heavy one, to say the least. Uh, I, th I think it was really insightful for for people who may not have had a lot of experience dealing with mental health themselves and or uh, dealing with mental health with one of their loved ones or um, at home or, or just being around, immersed um, and aware of those challenges. And, you know, in, in full transparency, this year, uh, I've had to deal with more of that um, th than I've ever had in my life. I, I, there has been multiple times where, um, you know, I was that person who was on the other side of the phone talking to somebody who's having suicidal thoughts or going to get somebody after um, something suicidal happened. And, and it's, I mean, it's been a reoccurring theme like many times this year. And, and I think like that firsthand experience just gave me a whole under a whole nother understanding of mental health that, um, you know, wasn't passed down from ge the, the generations uh, before it wasn't really taught in school. Um, and I think, you know, having to deal with that um, and having to, you know, find that balance of uh, compassion um, and 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 loving on someone through hard times, but also finding ways to communicate with other people who still can't understand what that person is going through, even though they're a part of the situation. You know, they're they're experiencing the same thing I'm experiencing with this person. They just can't see it how they're experiencing it, and and I think a lot of people want to. Um, get frustrated and, and and want to just try to, you know, push logic on the person who's going through mental health. Like, why can't you just see it this way? Or why can't we just do this? And, and, you know, haven't been in the middle of that where, you know, I'm trying to mediate both sides and, and I, and I understand kind of the logical perspective, but I understand that this person isn't in a logical place. And, and, you know, he really just spoke to that, right? It was, he was super open about his own suicide attempt and, and, and just really talking through that. And I think, um, you know, this time like a, around quarantine and around COVID, um, has really just increased, uh, the, the amount of pressure that, uh, people who struggle with mental health had had, you know, I know suicide rates have gone up. Um, and, and it, it was just a really relevant, uh, episode for me during that time. Um, I had just experienced something in, in like the, the week prior to that. And, um, yeah, it, it, it was, a it was heavy, but it, it was really, uh, insightful at the same time. Yeah. I love that, man. It's like, can you imagine in, in like the dating world going up to some girl and, and being like, Hey, here's a logical argument for why you should like me. I mean, I mean, like everybody would recognize that on its face to be absurd, right? You can't argue somebody with logic for why they should be attracted to you. Now, what you can do is you can make them feel stupid for the fact that they're not attracted to you. You can make them feel guilty for the fact that they're not attracted to you and you can make them feel confused. I don't know why I have an argument for why I ought to be attracted to this person, but I don't actually feel that attraction. It's the same way with mental health. You can't give a, give a person a bunch of logical reasons for why they should be happy, for why they should feel peace, for why they shouldn't be afraid and expect them to just respond to a logical argument. You know, Larry Sharp talked about that a lot, how one of the bi biggest difficulties we have when, when we identify with spaces that, you know, is fighting for freedom or fighting to help people live freer lives is we just don't acknowledge that to be a human being isn't just to be logical, that human beings, we are emotional. And we feel all sorts of things that we don't know how to cope with or change. And giving us a math equation or giving us a philosophical argument doesn't address that. And what I loved about Richard Taylor's moment here is he kind of highlighted some of the ways that we do that to each other. And he gave people permission to find strength 
in being honest about your weaknesses. And when, when you find yourself having to pretend like you don't have a weakness, that's not a sign of strength. That's actually a sign of, of a weakness of a different kind, you know? But it, it takes a lot of power and a lot of responsibility to just even be like, hey, I don't know what to do. Hey, I need help. Hey, I'm going through this. And, and, and you don't do it for the sake of, of looking cute. You don't do it for the sake of proving to someone else that you're being sufficiently vulnerable or whatever it may be. You do it because you're being honest about what you need. And, you know, it, it's kind of like with the pursuit of knowledge. You, in order to learn something new, you got to admit that you don't know. And yeah. you got to be willing to ask a question. And, and the very act of asking a question is kind of like a concession. I don't know everything. And you got to be able to do that with your psychological health as well. And so I, I, I encourage everybody to listen to that whole episode because he does talk about his own story and how he was on the verge of committing suicide. And he had to overcome a lot of these mental health stigmas in order to be able to get the assistance that he needed. And now the brother is living a life where he is able to help others do the same and he's able to find great strength and fulfillment in it. Yeah, well, I also just wanted to say that what I really enjoy about his movement and, and what he's doing is the level of accountability that he's bringing to the black community about mental health. Um, that, yeah. it, that, you know, we're no different from any other community in terms of uh, the kinds of challenges um, that people in our communities have about mental health. Um, and I think, <clears throat> I think there in a lot of ways is a lack of understanding there's a lack of compassion. And what he really did in that episode was outline uh, what that really looks like. You know, what are those phrases? Like your ancestors dealt with worse. Go depress some dishes, boy. Like things like that. Like, you know, we laugh at it because we've heard it before. Like it's it's a true statement. Um, and I yeah. think, you know, just really kind of airing that out. It, I think one takes courage, right? Because a lot of time, like even another statement that he said in his little monologue there was, you know, what happens in this house stays in this house. And I think it, it takes courage to really air that out. Um, but there's something powerful there because when you're being honest and transparent about that, those experiences, there is definitely other people who can relate to that. And I think that yeah. level of honesty helps people um, kind of work through the, their own challenges. And, and, I, and I just love the accountability piece. Um, and, and his accountability isn't like a scolding, like y'all need to do better. Uh, you know, this is unacceptable, but it's like, this is not right, but this is how we address it. Yeah. And I, I think that kind of, that accountability is so important because I feel like we have to lead that conversation in our own communities because other people ain't going to do it for us. When, when you look at how crime or just self-destructive behavior is talked about when black people engage it, we don't start the conversation with, hey, how have we failed these people by not talking enough about mental health? What are the mental health needs? What, what resulted in, in, in this person getting into a position where they felt like they had to do something? We just immediately go into Hey, stop, stop complaining about what other people are doing if y'all behaving like this. We just immediately go into, um, yeah, y'all need to take responsibility for your actions and so forth. And so I think in black communities, we have to, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm more than, than welcoming of anybody that wants to help our communities have these conversations. But man, if we don't take the lead on it, it won't happen. We got a lot of brothers and sisters out there that need a lot of help and before we can have a message on personal responsibility when it comes to your career or your finances or all these other things, we need to have a conversation on what it actually takes to even just be healthy at the level of knowing how to process your feelings and knowing how to think clearly about where you are in life. Because people won't be responsible and live responsibly if they can't even assess where they are and figure out how to cope where they are. Responsibility begins at that level. and. Um, I just love the work that that he's doing and that others like him are doing to uh, to help out in that regard. I think that's awesome. All right, I'm going to go to the third clip here. This was when we had uh, Thunder, Dr. Sean Thunder Wallace, join the show, and and this was during that time of COVID, and a big part of that conversation was about 
the concept of essential service and how creativity is an essential service. And, and a lot of people were, were in this position where people are just starting to get laid off and, and people are starting to get restless. And one of the things that Thunder talked about is why things like making art, making comedy, creating fiction, composing songs, this is not the time to put that stuff off, that the world needs these kind of things more than ever. So here's uh, brother, Dr. Sean Thunder Wallace. Best thing that we can do is put positive stuff out in the, in the universe. That's the best thing that we can do. Uh, it helps other people that are then, they themselves are feeling overwhelmed by this 24 hour news cycle and they just want something positive, you know? And it's not like in, for instance, in my quarantine interviews, the quarantine interviews weren't really about the coronavirus. Okay, now I named it that, yeah, it was like a marketing thing, whatever. But really, it, now we didn't avoid the topic, but we were talking about, you know, hey, how did you, why, why are you a musician? Why did you decide that, you know, music was going to be the thing for you, you know, and isn't music such a therapeutic and positive force? You know, I mean, we're talking about these kinds of positive topics that, um, you know, especially kids uh, would be, I think, hopefully inspired by to see some of their heroes, you know, to, you know, to see what their process was and to see that it wasn't all like, you know, a road paved with gold. There were some challenges and they had to overcome those challenges and persevere and be diligent and all these kind of positive kind of themes. Um, so I think putting positivity, uh, using our creativity to put so stuff that is, uh, you know, that's, that's worth something that's, that's going to help somebody other than ourselves. I think that's a great way to actually improve the situation. You know, it might not be a direct way. We might not specifically be using the talking points that uh, CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or whatever it is that, that any of them want us to use. That's not important. What's important is that uh, we as individuals do what only we can do to improve the world. For me, that one is is near and dear to my heart, man, because I feel like, especially in the social media space, everybody treats being informed and being responsible as if they they go hand in hand with just consuming the news and knowing about all the latest political happenings and knowing about all the latest tragedies. And And one of the things I loved about what Thunder was saying is that a significant amount of that stuff that everybody's got you focusing on is stuff that you can't even do anything about a lot of that stuff. And you still have to find a way to stay focused on what you can do so that you can reduce the amount of evil that's happening in the world and so that you can inspire more good in the world. And for a lot of people that comes down to a hey, keep reading your books, keep building your projects, keep showing up and practicing your craft and learning your instrument and keep teaching your students. And I, I love the way throughout that entire conversation, he reframed the concept of what it means to stay informed. Because for me, the best definition of staying informed is actually informing your own definition of what that means, what that means to be knowledgeable and be focused on the right things. One of my favorite clips from that interview is where you were talking about creativity as um as as something like we we appreciate the aftermath and and the products of creativity but we don't go into creativity uh chasing a specific um result so for example you talked about mm. you know we don't the reason we don't have iphones um or the reason we have iphones is not to record police or to um you know to, to, to have conversations about police brutalities. But the reason that we are able to do those kind of things is because somebody took the time to create a device that had a feature that allowed us to do 
certain things, right? Um, another example is the reason why uh, we have YouTube is not to have political debates, but the reason we have YouTube is that somebody took the time and the effort and the commitment into developing a platform that had many diverse features where we could have conversations about politics and we could um, connect with people around the world around certain topics. And I, I thought that was just such a powerful illustration that, you know, these topics, these hot topics that are in the news cycle or that mm -hmm. the media wants you to pay attention to, um, I, those can be addressed in your own creative way um, without necessarily focusing all your energy on them. And I think the, you know, the people who, who designed the iPhone weren't thinking about, you know, what this tool could do. They just were focusing on the work, focusing on developing the best of the best phone uh, that they possibly could come up with. And as a result of that, like we have this device that's empowered us in so many ways um, to conquer so many topics, to, to, to move the needle forward on so many issues. And, and I just love that, right? That, that's a great way to think about a lot of these hot button issues is, is remaining, remaining um, your position and holding faith in your ability to create something that might not have a direct you know, result mm. or a direct goal to solve a certain problems, but will, that will have indirect, um, indirect results that, that will help us as a whole move conversations forward or develop or fight the battles that we're trying to fight. Man, that's right on the money. It's like, you can say there are two distinct questions. One is what's necessary. The other question is what's interesting. And those two questions lead you in entirely different directions. And they're both important, but you can't get the answers that come from asking what's interesting by just focusing on what's necessary. Another way you can put this is you can say one question is, hey, what are the problems that we need to address? And another question is, what are the possibilities we're free to explore? Both of those questions are important, but they lead you in two different directions. And no matter how many problems we need to focus on, there are still possibilities we can explore and we don't get to discover what those possibilities can teach us if we're just focusing on the urgent, focusing on the problematic, focusing on what's right now. And some of our greatest ability to, to solve problems comes from the discoveries that we make by exploring possibilities. And we have to remind ourselves to exercise the, uh, the choice to do that. And we got a similar, uh, one with, uh, with Dr. Cartwright, kind of a similar theme. So this flows perfectly right into that. We had Dr. Cartwright join us. And one of the things he talked about was controlling your mental influence. So let's go into that clip here. Look at CNN, Fox News, Yahoo, you name it. A really high percentage of that content has got a negative spin. It's, it's, it's fear mongering or so many negatives to it and it's just not healthy. So I keep, you know, I keep books with me all the time, you know, that I'm, that I'm, uh, that I'm reading and, and throughout the day. Um, and I'm putting positive information into my mind every day. And that's how I stay positive. But if you get in this new cycle and are reading these things every day, people are really in a sense being manipulated with not outright lies. I wouldn't say that, but definitely a lot of partial truths certain information is given without the rest of the story and the context isn't there and it takes people down a certain path. And you know, a lot you know, of content creators might be listening to this. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, and it actually reminds me of a recent, more recent conversation we had with Dr. Kelvin Elko, uh, the renowned sports psychologist. And he was talking mm -hmm. about his relationship with um, the head coach at the University of Alabama, um, the very famous uh, football program and the very famous coach, Nick Saban. And he was just talking about how high performing individuals are are really just laser focused on the things that they need to focus on right um mm -hmm. and it was around uh i think 2016 uh was was kind of the time 
of the story that he was telling. And and that's when President Trump had just got elected into his first term. Um, and as always with politics or, or presidential elections, there was a lot of controversy and, and, and drama around that. And, you know, it was a big topic. Everybody was talking about it. And he went and he asked Nick Saban, like, hey, Nick, uh, you know, what you think about the presidential election? Like who just got elected? And he was like, when did it happen? He was like, what? <laughs> it, 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 like happened yesterday. Like, who is it? You, you don't know who got elected? Like had no idea. Wasn't even plugged into that at all. Was laser focused on getting his football team to the national championship. And, and that's his process. That's what he decides to feed his brain. And I think there, there's another illustration here where, you know, you talk about fitness, you talk about getting healthy. So much of that is what you decide to put in your body. If you want your body to perform at, at you know, max, at its max potential, at its at the highest level um, that it can perform, then you have to pay attention to the things that you're feeding it. Um, same thing with cars, right? You're going to put the best kind of gas. You're going to you're going to give it all the care. And I think the same thing is true with our brains um, and our in our minds. What do you feed it? You know, what are the things that you're putting inside of it? People, high achievers like Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, uh, Nick Saban. You know, those people are very intentional about guarding um, their attention and guarding the things that they feed their minds. And yeah, that story, this past clip, it was just a really powerful illustration of that. Yeah, what I love about this clip is his emphasis on what are you putting first? And he talked about his books and how, how he keeps his books even by his bed. And he makes sure that he reads good material every day. And I think about people that feel like they are in charge of their lives. They, they take responsibility for setting the tone of their day. There was a tweet Charlemagne the God put up a long time ago. He said, most people wake up in the morning and they check social media to decide what they should what they should care about. Hmm. And it's like, that's such a horrible way to live, right? But when we're getting from Yahoo or Google, uh, YouTube, Twitter trends, or or Fox News, or any of these stations, that shouldn't be our starting point. You know, it's not about saying, hey, it's some kind of evil sin if you ever look at current events. But it's like, don't let that be your starting point. You've got to get to your mind before anyone else gets to your mind. The mm. first piece of information that hits your mind at the beginning of a day, that ought to be something that you decide based on what your priorities are. Like, hey, before I pop on this phone and see what's trending on Twitter, I want to start my day, at least the first 10 minutes, being like, well, what do I want to learn? What's the first thing I want to think about? And I, I think that's the most critical piece for me. All right, y'all y'all saw a little glimpse of that uh, Stephen Hart clip, so we're going to go right on to that one. Clip number five is my brother Stephen Hart talking about the power of persistence. You know, a lot you know, of content creators might be listening to this, um, and this is uh, a wisdom nugget. The second year, the, the first year we grew, and there was probably midway into the second year where there was a six month stretch from like summer almost into the, the, the beginning of the, the next year, where week after week, the downloads started to decline right mm. and we don't mm. talk about that right like you're continuing <laughs> to produce but the thing isn't growing right the thing isn't growing it's a year and a half to the two-year mark and i just continue to put out the contents what through the doubts through the concerns right and what happened we got to our second birthday february of 2018 Two weeks after our second birthday, Apple gave us our first homepage feature, put a banner up on the homepage of Apple, giving us love nice. in Black history. And we literally saw like a 5x bump in downloads and it leveled off to like three times the subscribers. And, you know, and from that point on, the podcast started to grow. So as content creators, you know, it's one thing to be like, yo, it's consistent. But truth be told, there are periods in there that sucked, you know, that you just weren't seeing progress. And, you know, lots of people are like, man, I need to grow my podcast. I need to grow my vlog, whatever it is you're trying to. And 
if it doesn't happen in a month, two, you're like, oh, this is failing. When in truth, you just need to remain consistent over that period of time, you know, and, um, and, and be patient with it. Man, th that was one of my favorites. I mean, he just had story after story, insight out of insight. What, what I carry away most from that particular clip is focus on impact rather than focus on making an impact rather than being an influencer. You know, like being an influencer is is ultimately the byproduct of making an impact. But we've made it into this sort of like separate status thing that it can be easy to focus on attaining. I want to become an influencer. And we think in terms of I, I want to get this many followers. I, I want to be able to get on these platforms, but yeah, what what kind of impact are you making? Like, like, how do you want to make a difference? What problems do you want to solve? Who do you want to help? It's kind of like when people say, how can I make a lot of money? Well, what, mm. what do you want to do? Do you have interests? Do you have any things that make you upset? I Man, I just want to make as much money as possible. I mean, that's great, but you're off to an absolutely horrible start if you got nothing else beyond that. You need mm. to tell me something that you're angry about something that you're just really interested in, somebody that you feel sorry for, that you want to help, something that you enjoy doing because the making money part is the byproduct of creating value and solving problems. And it's the same thing with becoming an influencer. It's knowing how you want to make an impact. And when you know how you want to make an impact, you don't get intimidated when you say, man, I only got 10 followers right now. It's okay because you feel good about that actually. Wow. I got 10 people and I'm making an impact on these 10 people. I'm making a difference in their lives. You don't say, yeah, but I'm not an influencer yet. And he just has so much to say about that. I encourage anybody that's new to the podcasting game, the blogging game, the influencer game to go listen to the live stream that we did with Stephen Hart because where he came from and where he is now, so much value, so much value. Yeah, his story was crazy. I'd, I'd be, it'd be remiss if I didn't mention his accent um, I, if I could buy an accent, I would buy his accent. <laughs> like if I could buy it and download it into the queue and just have that, you know, on lock, ready to go, it, it would definitely be his accent. Um, but he, he offered so many gems and nuggets in terms of content creation because, you know, he's, I think on his fifth or sixth year doing his podcast. And I think anybody who knows anything about content creation understands that it, it's a tiring process. And in a lot of ways, it can be disheartening because in order to create authentic content that people like, you really got to pour yourself into it. You can't uh, half ass content and expect it to perform well, um, as, at least consistently. You know, you might have one or two posts or one or two videos that blow just randomly. But if you're trying to produce consistent content and you're trying to build an audience and you're trying to connect with people like you have, you have to give it, you have to give it a part of yourself. And so, you know, it's tough when you, when you face those numbers and, you know, you, you get like five likes and like a reach of like 10 people and, and, and doing that, you know, week over week or, you know, day after day, um, it, it's, it's disheartening. And I think, you know, his message in so many words was was just to trust the process. I think um, it's really hard to, to you know, you hear that conventional wisdom and you want to believe it. Um, but when you're kind of in those down slopes and you're in those valleys, um, if, if nobody's telling you that, I think you can get in your own head and you just get psyched out and you get deterred. But, you know, that was just a really powerful uh, testament. Like, look, you know, you, you have to trust the process. It's not just this old adage, um, but there is a lot of value in that. And I think, you know, that's just such a, a wide ranging uh, principle that I, it applies for so many things outside of content creation. But in this episode, that's really what his specialty is and, and what he was speaking towards. And I mean, I can't tell y'all how much I needed that episode. Like personally, um, I, yeah. I needed to hear that. Um, and it, it was, just, it, it, it was one of my favorite episodes of, you know, the, the, however many we've done, um, definitely. Yeah. You know, something you made me think of is 
the difference between being good slash interesting and being trusted and respected. And I think in the content creation game, it can be easy to underestimate the importance of being trusted and respected by your audience and, and to overemphasize being good and being interesting. And so if you put out a couple of things and it doesn't go viral and you know everybody doesn't love it, it's easy to just say, well, this clearly isn't good or clearly isn't interesting. And that sort of undersells the value that can only come from winning people's trust and respect by consistently doing it. You know, so when, when I used to work as a financial planner, this was my first job after college, I had someone tell me that what many people do when they get approached by like a, a financial professional is they say, yeah, I'm interested, call me in a year, call me in a year, because they want to see if that person's gonna even still be around in a year, because mm -hmm. the revolving door and so many people don't last that there are people who just look at what you do. They're like, okay, call me in a year. Let, let's see how this works out in a year because the people that are still doing it a year later, they're for real. I can respect them. I can trust them. I know that they really mean it and that they really believe in it because if you can't stick around for longer than a year, were you doing it because you thought you'd get rich? Were you doing it because you thought you'd get famous? Because the guy who just keeps showing up, all right, He's in this for the long haul. That's the person mm. that's going to make it. Mm. Yeah. Let's do one more, man. This is with, uh, we actually had our creative director, Sean Malone on. And this was in the middle of a lot of conversation and debate about cancel culture. And we had him on for a discussion on that. So this is Sean Malone on communication and cancel culture. The way that you communicate with people and the way that they perceive your communication is something that you have to take ownership of as well. Like there are a lot of different approaches to communication, some of which are going to get you yelled at or slapped or, you know, I mean, there's ways to approach people and to start conversations with people that are really effective. There are other ways that are really not effective. And it, it's never made a lot of sense to me to blame your audience for their reaction. My challenge is I also am a strong believer in free speech. And part of that for me is, is fostering society where people are comfortable with disagreement and don't immediately try to shout other people down or cut their mic mm -hmm. or, you know, like, show up at their events and, and try to, you know, try to shut the lights off or, or drown them out or whatever. And we've seen a lot of that over the last several years. I mean, over the last eight, eight years or so, seven or eight years, we've seen more and more and more of this kind of deplatforming movement and, and different kinds of people, you know, haven't been in, literally haven't been allowed to speak, right? So there's one thing of paying a price because people just react negatively to what you're saying. I think it's another thing entirely, and this is where I think cancel culture really is a problem, is where they are literally showing up to your speech and trying to stop you from, from talking, flat out trying to stop you from talking. There's, that is to me the line between, between paying, you know, having consequences for your ideas and actually having society where people are being illiberal and trying to, you know, violate the core principles of free speech, which is that people should, in fact, not be, you know, uh, not be physically silenced. I think that brother had had the best word on, on, on the whole debate. And it's interesting to listen to that now because we're, we're starting to see elements of censorship that, that weren't even happening at the time we had this conversation. So now we're seeing on Twitter, on YouTube, Google, if you search for certain things or you pull up certain videos, especially if it's a philosophical topic or a political topic or a scientific debate, you're gonna see a bunch of fact check claims or like a bunch of disclaimers that say this topic is being debated or this is being disputed or you know this is false or something along those lines and i know that the mainstream rhetoric behind that practice is supposed to be something like well 
we, we want to let people know that they're listening to something that's questionable and people should know. And for me, my question is, what's the purpose of critical thinking? What's all this talk about critical thinking even for if we now have these central bodies deciding for the rest of us what's acceptable to believe and what's not acceptable to believe? what ideas are acceptable to entertain and what ideas are not acceptable to entertain. I even saw a debate. I was watching some YouTube video about, um, I believe it was climate change. And, and um, there was a clip where on the Bill Murray show, some guy was trying to debate him and Bill Murray was saying, look, the debate is settled. The debate is settled. And he said, um, you know, like humility is when you understand that a debate is settled. And his guest says, no, like, being humble is when you're willing to like entertain new ideas. And he says, no, being humble is about believing scientists. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like being scientific isn't about believing scientists. It's about being willing to subject everything that anyone says, including scientists to the scientific method or the very method that makes them credible in the first place. But we, we now have this culture where it's like, hey, believe the experts and, and and science and so many other things have become very cult-like and religious-like because the experts are the high priest and you're supposed to listen to them. You're not supposed to question them. They decide for us what's disputed, what's factual, what's safe. They give us the disclaimers and we say, thank you. And it's like, no, you, you've, gotta, you've gotta create an environment where people are free to disagree and where it's okay to have a platform where you debate things because if something is true, everyone benefits from seeing how good of a job the truth does at standing up to scrutiny. And, and, and I think that's one thing about Sean's mm. point that was so important. The moment we become too uncomfortable with disagreement just because it's controversial or it goes against the mainstream, we deprive ourselves of the opportunity to learn the most important groundbreaking breaking truths. Mm. Mm, that's super well said. And I, and I agree. I think that Sean had the best words for, you know, that clip. Um, it, it's hard to really even add to that. I think what I would say is that, you know, as, as we've just witnessed coming off of this election cycle um, and coming off of this presidential um, election, that I think a lot of people on both sides of the equation have felt frustrated with the amount of polarization that our country is experiencing. And I think I really liked Sean's perspective of having and, and, you know, working toward a society where we can talk openly about things. Um, because I think the further, the, the, the further that you, you know, allow people to stay isolated and 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 you disrupt the ability to to have those conversations and to have meaningful dialect i think you just increase the amount of polarization like polarization to me isn't just um somebody putting clickbaity uh you know trigger happy kind of like headlines up and firing up their own crowd of people i think it's also not allowing people to talk to each other censoring conversations that would help move the needle forward and in a lot of ways there's like a lot of conspiracies that like the the system or um you know uh, the 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 way that this is set up is is for or is to polarize people is to keep um people separate is to maintain this red versus blue um and i i think that the the more that we can have and cultivate a society that is open to objective conversations and, and trying to understand both sides and trying to understand each other, like the closer we're going to be able to meet in the middle. And yeah. And, and I think people, uh, I think it, it can be disconnected, right? People can say, man, well, they just think this and that, and they're so, you know, aggravated and this and that. And, but then they, they kind of go back and they're like, Oh, our country is so divided. Our country is so polarized, you know, the politicians are so this. And I think, you know, that's it starts at the it starts at the individual level, right? Like if you're not willing to even have those conversations, then of course, like of course the system is gonna be divided. Of course you're not gonna be able to have those conversations. And and to me, like people who can't see 
uh, past that, who can't see past the rhetoric, um, they're, it's a perpetual cycle and, and they're not helping it. Um, they're not helping you unite people by, you know, staying in that cycle of we, we can't listen to them or, or they can't say those things or, you know, what, what they're talking about is dangerous. And, you know, if you really believe that you're a truth seeker, then I think, like you said, the truth, the reason the truth is so valuable um, is, is because it can stand the test of scrutiny. It can stand people questioning that and it, and it will continue um, to, to hold strong in that. And I think if we're not able to put that truth up to scrutiny, if we're not able to, to question that and have um, that kind of dialect, then there's going to be all these different versions of truth. Um, and we're not, you know, things aren't going to progress. We're, you know, we're, we're not going to unite. We're not going to uh, be able to have um, conversations that really actually do move the needle forward because we got people um, who are highly intelligent on both sides. Right. And I think without them being able to work together, you know, we're, we're, we're stagnant. Yeah. Absolutely right, man. People don't need to be protected from debates and disagreements and uncomfortable conversations. They need to be taught how to have them intelligently and empathetically and constructively. Um, but we've seen all too often, you know, two people are arguing, two people are debating, everybody comes in, no, 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 don't do that. Like that's just intrinsically bad. But uh, we actually need to fight for more fighting as long as we're fighting in a way that doesn't involve violating one another's individual rights. Man, we are at time. For those of you all who are listening, you can check us out at feed.org slash rev1. You can check out replays to all the past live streams on the YouTube channel, Revolution of One YouTube channel. You can follow Kamau and I at our handles here, me at TK underscore Coleman, Kamau at what now Kamau. Check us out on Instagram as, as well, the Rev1 channel on Instagram. Check me out, official TK Coleman on Instagram. And we will see you all next week on Tuesday, TK's Two Cents, Wednesday, coming back for another The Revolution Will Be live stream. Peace out, y'all. Create a great day.